Okay, let's get started with our second presentation tonight. And you know spring is right around the corner when people start thinking about starting their own transplants from seed. And here to help us be successful in growing our own transplants is Todd Weinman. Todd is the horticulture educator for Cass County. So welcome, Todd, to the forum. Hello, and thank you for coming tonight. Um, Tom won't let me use any sharp instruments like last year for the apple tree grafting, and so um, he found a safer project for me to talk on. Um, we'll get started here as soon as our, there we go. Um, and I was gonna say too, sometimes when I'm at a presentation, I know maybe some of you are too, you think of a question and wanna ask it, but maybe, or, or maybe you don't think of it until later. If you wanna give me a call at um, my office, 241-5707, uh, if you think of a call later or later on this week um, and wanna ask about um, starting seeds, um, you sure can. So it's 241-5707. <clears throat> uh, we're gonna to talk tonight about some basics in seed starting. We're going to talk about obviously what I have on your seeds, containers, potting medium, fertilizer, light, and watering. One thing to keep in mind is that there's more than one way of doing it. I'm just going to go through a, a few different ways or, or different types of um, materials so that you can get started with this on your own. Many people that first start planting seeds indoors uh, want to do the heirloom or the open pollinated um, type of type of seeds. And, and I can understand why. I'm gonna go through um, a little bit of um, the difference between hybrid and open pollinated heirloom first before, um, before you get your um, self set in stone or before hopefully you buy too many of, of one or the other. Um, hybrid seeds are developed and, and they have hybrid vigor. And what that is, they're a cross of more than likely or, or usually an open pollinated heirloom plant. And um, the, the offspring of that many times is called F1. These are stronger plants, disease resistant, higher yield. They ship well. Many of your, your uh, fruits and vegetables that come from distant states and other countries are hybrid. Um, one thing that's a little different with that though is the open pollinated or the heirloom varieties. They all have different flavors, different colors. They tend not to ship well. Um, they, do, they are not as strong a plant. They tend to get more insects attacking. Um, the yields tend to be, to be less. However, the, the flavor is is very nostalgic. Um, if you had a, a grandparent or, or, or an older relative or a friend that used to garden when you were a child, many of the flavors and colors that you'll find with the heirlooms were plants they grew. And so there, there are reasons for growing them. But um, if you're first starting out and have never gardened before, I would go with, with hybrid so you have some success and, and throw in a few pollinators or open pollinated. To buy seeds or not, you can save a lot of money if you know what you're doing when you save your seeds. If you don't, you can basically spend a season growing a plant and when you taste the fruit, it'll be woody, no flavor, extremely hard, um, very bad flavor. And, and, and so saving your seeds, I, I might try it, but I wouldn't base your whole garden on that. Say for example, you had a bean seed, that, a variety of beans that you enjoyed, and they were an heirloom or, or um, open pollinated variety and you didn't have any other beans around and your neighbors didn't grow anything um, any type of beans yeah you could save those um, now if you had a hybrid tomato and you thought wow these are the best tomatoes i've ever had you save the seeds i can pretty much guarantee they're not going to come true to form and what you'll get is a tomato but what they've crossed with or what um their their fruit tastes like is is basically unknown um, organic is a is another topic that that could warrant an hour so we're, we're just going to touch on that um, so a lot of your heirloom and, and some of your hybrids too are grown organically uh, they, the organic market is one that's um, very big or especially in some of your larger um, cities like Washington DC and such and there, there's also some in in different towns too, so it's kind of a, a more of an emerging market, I would say. I, I do like um, the flavor of both, however. So as far as organic, um, I guess it's up to you as a per personal preference or a lifestyle, maybe. Hybrid, uh, we talked about that. Um, 
you can get a variety of seeds for both, uh, a, a large variety. And if, if you don't think, or for example, let's say you wanted Hawaiian tomatoes. They're fantastic. Um, there's a variety called pineapple. It's an heirloom. I try to grow one every year. It, it produces a few um, very nice, fantastically orange and red striped uh, tomatoes, but I, I don't grow them for storage. They, um, my understanding is some of the hybrid or the heirlooms and the open pollinated don't have the same acid content, but the, the, the main reason I don't grow them is that they're not as reliable as the hybrid um, vegetables like early girl, celebrity. Containers. This is one where um, people will, for example, have containers on their balcony or, or where, where, wherever they have them. And a lot of times they go by um, the visual appearance, and I can understand that, but the um, structure of the container is also very important. One thing, um, if, you, if you think back to at a time when people had a lot of clay containers, many people grew the clay, you know, that's all, basically all they had, and they, they used those. One thing nice about a clay container is, and, and I guess it depends on who you ask, it might not be so nice, but if you notice on the outside, there's always a salt buildup. What a clay container will do is, is when you water your plant, salt will actually work its way through the clay pot to the outside. So it's actually pulling salt out of, out of your soil. Um, it's unsightly. People have um, stopped that process by glazing and um, kind of defeats the purpose of a, a clay pot. One thing, which one is right? I always tell people to go by how wide it is, but also how deep it is. Um, your roots will go down more than an inch or two in, in a lot of your larger plants, and it's good to have a nice deep pot as well as a wide pot in regards to, to, to the size of the pot. This is a, I could say cute because I have two daughters, um, but um, it's a very cute little pot, but there's something wrong with it, and th there is no drainage. So as you add water to this, soon you have kind of a boggy, slimy mess inside that never really dries out. Um, and also you start to get diseases that really enjoy that environment. Your salt layers will build up and as time goes on, when you water, you're actually creating salt water because of the salt that's been left over in there. This one's better. You can see the one drainage hole in the front. However, it's still glazed um, and there is only one drainage hole. And another thing, it's way too small. You might grow a little tiny, maybe a succulent or something in there. But as far as a vegetable, I, I really can't think of anything that would do well in a pot this size. A very important thing, drainage holes. Um, and people say, well, we want to conserve water. We don't want to waste water. Why would you ever have holes in the bottom of your container? Um, the water that we have here in the area has salt in it. Not a lot, just a tiny little bit. But if you don't drain the water or, or pour the water so the water goes through and out the bottom of the container, after a while you'll build up a salt layer in there and one day when you water, the water will hit that salt layer and your plants will have a real problem. So you water and water goes out the bottom. Here's an example of a, a typical pot and you can see it's got a number of holes in the bottom um, evenly spaced. They don't have to be, but it is nice. And that, that's a, an example of good drainage in a pot. There are a number of different types of pots. Um, sometimes people will plant in the coconut core is a oh, very nice pot. There, there are no, nu no nutrients in coconut core, but you can plant it in there. Um, a lot of your nurseries like this. It's a very clean, uh, fairly durable container. Um, sometimes people will take and cut through the side if they if they've had troubles with the roots getting through there, it's um, it's something that once it's done, you can rototill it into your garden if you want. Uh, compressed peat moss. Um, peat moss is a is a very nice product also for adding organic matter to your garden. However, sometimes um, depending on the variety of um, pot that you get, and I'm not going to say which ones, but um, some of them, the, the roots get bound in there and they won't break through. And so you have to physically cut the pot or, or try to take the pot off the plant. Um, some, though, if you plant it, it'll go right through it and it's fantastic. So you'll have to figure that out yourself as far as which variety or which one. Commercial likes to use plugs, uh, plug trays, and there's machines or um, 
graduate students, high school students, students of some kind that will um, plant these. And, and this is what more for a commercial person. However, um, a homeowner can use these too. They're very um, nice, neat, clean, easy, not that expensive. And um, I, I use both. One way, um, some people say, well, do you have to put them all individually in pots? You can, or you can do like this. Here's some onions growing. Um, the onions are, well, I didn't dump them in, but basically what I do is I'll sprinkle them over soil, add some more soil, and here you can see a milk jug um, with um, holes uh, cut in there for drainage, and water them, and they come up, and then when I want to transplant them, I um, take a scissors and I'll cut the container, and I'll break them apart gently, and I'll pot them into a um, little bit larger size containers, and, um, and it seems to work well for me. It, it, especially when I'm in a hurry. Here, if you don't, you know, you could put them in something like these, like these commercial plug trays, or you could start them right in there too. Um, sometimes with a plug tray, what I'll do is I'll plant, for example, two in a cell, and sometimes I'll do one if I'm short on seed, but I like two because um, that way if, if something were to happen, you had something wrong with your germination or whatever, your, your trays fill up nicely. So here's just an example of um, plants grown in, in um, some peat moss and the next slide you can kind of see and this is something that if I were um, going to put it into a pot for example I would just dig it right in and plant it right there and, and be done um, it's um, nice easy and it's it's fairly clean so some people really like this um, your containers they like here's an example of um, containers that are just barely big enough for these tomatoes and um, and then that's fine um, it's just yeah, you use what you which what, what is appropriate. Here's an example of um, they're they're just um, they could be slightly bigger, but they weren't. It was at a high school or an element, or I mean middle school. Um, the plants are doing fine in there, and if you notice, they have good drainage. But they have all types of containers, and so one thing to keep in mind is if it's outdoors and you're growing plants, um, stay away from your metal containers um, unless you want to cook your plants. And this is just an example of a raised bed. I, I put that in there because um, I liked it, I guess. <laughs> Potting media. Um, when you plant your, when you start your seeds, um, I would suggest just purchasing it, inexpensive, ready to use, it's clean. Um, not everybody likes to do what I say, and, and that's perfectly fine for you. Um, I, I just purchase it. What I'll do is I'll go to your local nursery and I'll say, what do you use to start your vegetables, your flowers? And, and they always tell you, and they'll say it's this one, but we have something cheaper or whatever. Um, I always use what the nurseries um, use, and I, I've never had bad luck with that. Um, many times it, it's um, it's not exactly like the soil that you would use in a pot. It's more airy. It has different um, spacing elements in it, but um, it, it's not that expensive to, to purchase it. Um, if you're going to make it, now it becomes a little tricky. Um, what I would suggest if you've never made it before and had success, you might want to try several recipes. Um, so a lot of times people will add actual soil from the garden. Um, if you do that, I would definitely pasteurize it to kill the bad flora and fauna and other creatures in there. Uh, pasteurization will, will, will do that. The problem is where do you pasteurize it? Um, as a young horticulturalist recently married, I had brought in a um, cookie tray or actually a cake pan filled with soil and I um, cooked it in the oven and my wife my new wife came home and um, I guess I've never really done it since then but um, I wouldn't suggest that if you're um, married to anyone to actually pasteurize your own soil unless you can have a place in the garage or, or somewhere else because it does have a nice um, oh, intense earth smell to it when it um, gets into your home. Also I if you're doing your potting media um, you can add fertilizer. I would, I would, if you're brand new to this, start with a slow release fertilizer. And people always say, well, there's always numbers on there, and, and the numbers pertain to nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Sometimes if there's another number, it might be sulfur or zinc. I would be more concerned with um, a bag that had three numbers, though, um, as far as for fertilizer. Um, many times your your potting media for starting seeds will have um, some peat moss, perlite, uh, which is the volcanic rock. Um, might have some shredded coconut core, soil, several other things. I would think that if you're starting this and you had some slow-release fertilizer in, the, in there and some little perlite 
Spangen and peat moss mix, um, you'd be fine to to start with that. But they're the it's almost limitless what you can stick in there. But remember, it's um, you're just starting these plants; they're not growing in it for the whole season. Fertilizer, say you didn't want to use a, a slow release fertilizer, I would I would apply it um, when you watered once a week, but I would also dilute it to a fourth strength. So if it says, and in the, in the directions are fairly simple on these um, different types of fertilizer, I would use a fourth strength. So if it said one, one scoop, I would use a fourth of a scoop and only once a week. And if you don't, um, many times you can burn your, your plants. They're very fragile, um, they're tender. And so that's what I would do to start. I don't really see a, a big difference personally in organic versus commercial fertilizer. I go whatever is the cheapest and um, I've had good luck with that. Here you can see the numbers is a 0 0.05, so that'd be the N or the nitrogen, zero and zero, so phosphorus and potassium. I wouldn't use something like this for, for um, when you're first starting with your plants and, and not really, and fairly new to it. Basically it has nitrogen in it and um, and for, for your plant's growth, you're going to want phosphorus and potassium also. Um, there's a number of different sources for fertilizer. Uh, bat guano, I, I kind of like um, that, that name. But, um, you know, I would use that as well as a commercial fertilizer. Um, I would just go by the cost myself. But if you are organic or, or maybe a natural um, type person, you might want to consider something like this, I guess. And you can barely see the numbers, but if you see there are three numbers on there um, versus a zero, and so um, it's more important. I like a 10-10-10 or a 20-20-20 um, fertilizer, but many times you can't always get what you are um, looking for when you go to, a, to um, for example, a store because there are so many possibilities of what can be out there for sale that they can't physically stock at all. If you wanted a certain type, you could always talk to your, your um, local nursery and say, hey, can you order this? And, and they usually do. Um, potting media, you know, and, and I've seen some people's um, recipes for, for, for potting media and um, I kind of cringe. I, I like it real simple and I, if you're just starting, I would just buy it and then um, maybe do some experimenting later with this. I wouldn't um, suggest just making something. I've done that before and um, had a lot of problems with um, plants just dying from um, black rot, um, fungal diseases, um, sometimes insects would get in there, sometimes they dry out, sometimes they turn into little rocks. Um, so it, if you like that type of thing, um, it's up to you, I guess. Light, I think the best light obviously is the sun. Um, there are some very good lights out there, but it's really difficult to, to beat the sun as far as light, and we're, we're going to touch on that. That could be probably a, a month-long conversation, but um, I'll give you the nuts and bolts here in just a couple minutes. Um, the, light, the sun obviously has the full color spectrum for plants. Um, not always possible, though. For example, if you have room in your basement and you want to grow, start some seeds, um, you might want to try something else. Um, LED lights, um, I, I like them a lot. They're very nice. Um, they last a long time, no mercury, um, and, and they don't really produce heat. I like that. Um, fluorescence, they, they tend to be okay. Um, they, they're not as long-lasting as the LEDs, and I have broken several of them. I'm, I'm quite clumsy, and so I'll turn and I'll just uh, got to buy new bulbs. And so now I just keep extras on hand, but um, I, I am, if you're clumsy, I wouldn't recommend fluorescence. So I'd go with the LEDs. And incandescent bulbs, um, you're, you're never really going to get a decent plant. They're, they're not much heat, not enough light, or too much heat, not enough light, and they, they just don't work for growing plants. Here's a very nice little setup. If you look, you can see the, the, the little lights at the top, and um, we'll have a picture here too. I think it's the next one. And um, if you notice, well, maybe you can't see it, but if you can, these lights go up and down. And so I could move these lights, these are LED lights, um, you know, an inch or two, probably two inches away from the plant in case I forget so they don't grow into there and be a big mess. But um, I would lower those down, and as they grew, I would raise them up, these lights. And it's a very nice um, way of doing things. It's simple. It's very nice. Ideally, this is what you want. You want your seed to sprout and um, form roots. And, and many times, if you look at the, the, um, the plant on the right, you think, oh, look at the leaves. Those aren't leaves. Those are cotyledons that the plant is using for food. 
and they are not leaves. So when someone says true leaves, usually the next set that looks like those are actually the, the first set of leaves. So when you see this and someone says, oh, you should move them when they, first, when they get their first leaves, these are not actually leaves, so you'd want to wait. Uh, we touched on fertilizer. Um, one thing for when your plants start growing, it's a good idea to keep them moist. Um, some people will keep a, a spray bottle in there and spray their plants um, to keep the plants from the edges from turning brown. Many times people let the water um, maybe set out away from kids and pets that will destroy it and wreck your floor when they tip it over, but um, keep it away from them. And then you could water your plants with that, but you could also mist them a, a couple times a day to keep them um, to keep them going good. The excess water, oh, can you jump back there, Bob? Sorry. I'm sorry, I, I should have. Um, the excess water that from the bottom of these trays, I would just throw away. I would not use that for um, water the plants again. Many times it has salts in it and um, it doesn't really help, that type of thing. And do not fertilize until the first two leaves. There they are. If you see the um, cotyledon leaves or the false leaves on the, on the lower part, um, those are not the leaves, but you can see the top leaves actually look different. These actually look like little tomato leaves. So that's when I would first start start to fertilize with them. And then to plant them into a container or your garden, you're going to want to harden them off. Um, I, I'm embarrassed to say, but many times I forget to do this, and I have to go with my backup tray because um, I will take them. It's like, yeah, I'm going to get out there and plant, and what happens is that they, they fry right up. And so for hardening off, what I'll do is um, if it's a nice shady day, I'll take them out. Maybe a week before I want to actually put them in the garden. And I will um, put them underneath a, a shrub or um, in the shade of a tree, water them really well, and just leave them out maybe for an hour. And the next day, a couple hours. And then third day, three hours. And then, you know, it, it, they, they start to get tougher and tougher plants um, as, as you go on with this. And the reason being is that they're in such a – a safe, um, controlled environment. There's no wind. There's no bugs or insects. There, there's really nothing to, to bother them. Um, the temperature is about the same. So if you do it gradually, they will they will toughen up, and then you can plant them with with more success. Um, transplanting or not, um, I would wait at least until the first or second set of leaves. Obviously, these little plants are not ready to transplant, so I would wait. Um, before I ask ask for questions, um, I personally um, would start my tomatoes and peppers um, a couple days ago. I, I haven't yet, but I, I will be starting them soon. It's a good time for that. Um, certain things um, as far as what not to um, plant early, it would be like sweet corn. I, I would never do that. So are there, are there questions or did everyone fall asleep here? I'm gonna Paul, be, before we can I show these or show yeah, them? Yeah, let me stop. I can. Oh, okay. Okay, you're good. I have a couple of props. Um, here's a, a tray with um, some cells, and, and this is just a small um, one that you can that you can purchase. They're very easy. Um, this 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 tray right here is just one one not a large cell, but just one cell. And this is where I might um, sprinkle a, a bunch of tomatoes or onion seeds in here, peppers, and um, get them going that way, and then break them apart. And I'd rip or cut the tray to um, the trays really, and then recycle it. Here's a coconut core, um, a little bit sturdier than your than your peat moss. And here's some um, some peat moss and um, easily planted. And um, there, there's a number of different um, types of these, and they're similar in shape, but they have the same purpose. And I like trying different ones. Um, everyone will have a, a different favorite. So. Okay, are we ready for questions? Okay, let's get them going here. Todd, can you hear me? Todd, Todd I can hear you. Okay. Um, so I've gone deaf. I go ahead, Tom, and I'll I'll pass okay. the question on to Todd. All right. Um, First question is, can you recommend some of the easiest flower seeds to start indoors? Seeds to, 
now I think of only tough things to start. Um, you know, Zinnias, Cosmos. Uh, I, I love starting those. They're, they're 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 super easy. They're fun to grow. I, I one thing I, I like to try and I don't have a lot of success with is impatience. I find them very difficult to grow. Um, probably everybody else doesn't, but I have a hard time with them. Um, some of your um, oh, and nasturtiums are fun, and, and nasturtiums are a nice one too because. Um, Kids can um, plant those, you know, if you have some of your early microscopic, basically your seeds, it's hard to hard to plant with that. Um, I like sunflowers, but I, I wouldn't start them inside. Maybe if you had like a teddy bear or something like that, but I wouldn't, your larger sunflower seeds, I wouldn't, wouldn't start inside. Uh, pansies I've started inside. Snapdragons are really good. You know, you know uh, things like that, I guess. Okay, how about some uh, tips on planting seedlings near windows is there a certain direction of sunlight or some some uh, obstacles we face you have um, natural sunlight coming in through your window um, you might think south is the best um, be careful though you want to kind of observe it during the day to see how hot it actually gets um, it might be just really nice and um, it, there's a lot of sun there I guess you'll have to kind of figure that out. One thing too, when you're growing next to a window, uh, we still have some cold temperatures that could come. Um, some of you out in the state are probably being buried by snow right now. So if you have it next to the window, especially at night, um, they might actually get frostbite. So I would um, keep that in mind as far as heat and cold. Another thing is too, it, the plants will grow toward the sun. And so if the light's coming in from there, um, maybe every day, maybe every other, or maybe every other day, um, I would just take and turn the tray completely around so that the plant would have to go back and that would actually help toughen the plant up too um, type of thing so that's what I would do. How about do you recommend having a fan on the seedlings when you grow them in the house? A fan on seedlings? You know I've seen that at nurseries um, you know I, I would wait until they they were a little bit bigger before I thought of doing something like that the reason I would is um, you can dry them out quite quite easily there isn't a lot of um, soil there and there is a lot of water in the soil so uh, when you turn the fan on they can um, respire and, and dry right up so if you're going to do that um, say that the weather was terrible and you wanted to plant them out in your garden or in a pot and you wanted to start hardening them off I would do a fan but I, I went maybe like um, oh maybe five minutes just to see how they, they looked and then I would water them really good and I would kind of you know maybe a half hour would be fine I, I really don't think it would I think they would dry right up I suppose it depends on the strength of your fan. So I would I would start off real cautious and then get a little more aggressive as time went on. But um, if you dry them out and they die, you have to start over or you're done. You know, so you don't want to kill them. Todd, do you recommend warming mats? And if so, when do you turn them off? Warming mats? Yeah, I, I like warming mats. Um, what what I as far as turning them off. I don't know. I, what I do is I wait until um, I'll plant the seeds and I'll water them good and probably like, you know, a day or two later. And I, I think there's different ways of doing this. I'll turn on a warming mat at a low heat and just kind of make it nice and warm and snug and they'll start growing. And um, as far as turning them off, I might turn them off at night. I don't know. I, I just, um, I don't have them on very long. I guess personally I, I've used them. I've only left them on for maybe I don't know, three hours a day, four hours a day, just to give them a little extra zip. I don't leave them on 24 hours. Um, it's, it's like lights, too. Um, leaving lights on for your plants 24 hours, some plants, um, really, it doesn't doesn't help them at all. And that, that's another topic. But some plants, um, they're, um, more light really doesn't do much for them. So I guess I would, um, I don't have an exact answer for you there. But they're especially important for germination. Right. The warming mats. Help with germination, um, certain seeds, and, and you can read actually on the package many times. Um, as far as germination, it'll say must be 62 degrees Fahrenheit for germination, for example. And then, yeah, if you have a warming mat, you can put it to that temperature, and um, your germination will increase, or actually will germinate. Um, some things, like for example, corn, which isn't a good example for our starting seeds, but um, if it's too cold, they don't germinate and they rot in the soil. So yeah, um, for germination, uh, a warming mat would be fantastic. But I would definitely know what you're doing um, so that 
if you're oh I was five degrees off you know and so that you did, had it on but not warm enough I, I would I would read up on your plant a little bit before you did before you um, just turn them on and seeing what happened how about do you have a rule of thumb about wattage for the lights um, what I do is I'll go to um, it used to be um, I would go to the oh, whatever box store and I would purchase um, cool cool fluorescent bulb and a warm fluorescent bulb and that would have the full color spectrum as far as um, all the all the light colors that the plant needed to grow um, my understanding is with the new LED lights they're um, they're incorporated in there more um, I'm, I'm still a little bit um, confused as to the exact perfect LED light and the wattage and everything like that that would be the best um, I, I'm still still trying to figure out which is the best I do like them better than the, the fluorescence um, so as far as an exact answer I don't know how do you know when your plants are getting too much light or too little light if they're getting a lot uh, I'm assuming they can hear these questions right? okay if your plants are getting tall and lanky it's a good chance they could use a little more light you know, if you have um, adjustable lights, you can lower them down closer to the plants. And that sometimes helps. Um, you might need to add another another array of um, another bulb in there somehow. Um, so that you know, and two little lights, a similar type of thing too. They get kind of light green, um, thin, sickly looking. It's like, wow, who grew that? You're kind of embarrassed. Um, you know, if it's kind of a light green color, I would say it's there's one 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 symptom of it or that's one symptom of not enough light do you have any any an opinion on miracle grow potting soil <clears throat> um endorse anyone i've tried to get into um kickbacks from all these companies and no one will give me any <laughs> money and so um i can't endorse anyone until someone actually does you know um i've used a, a lot of different potting soils and um i guess I would definitely go and talk with your local nursery if you're not sure. I, I can't say anything about Miracle Grow or anything like that. Um, okay. Just have to throw it out there for you, Todd. Just uh, maybe I'll get an endorsement deal for you someday. Uh, how about uh, some flower seeds need light to germinate and others don't? Do you have a rule of thumb about handling that when you start flower seeds? Basically, for, for any seeds, I'll look on the package. Um, you know, there, there's a reason they might say um, sprinkle on top of the soil when, you know, danger of frost is passed. When you're sprinkling, for example, on top of the soil, you don't need, or in fact, it, it might be detrimental for the seed to be buried too deep or um, covered, or they won't germinate well. Um, I've had good luck, for example, with, with lettuce, just sprinkling it and then running water over the top, just, um, just so they get slightly dirty. They do very well. Um, when I've dug a nice little trench of an inch deep and buried them and then watered them, um, I get one or two popping up. Um, many times your seed packets will say, um, you know, how deep to plant these. I would go by that. Um, there's a lot of exceptions to the rules. And if you follow the directions on the seed packets, um, they've been tried and true for, for years and years, decades. And um, that's what I would do. I, I would do that. Do you recommend that when we start seedlings that we cover them with plastic to help them germinate? Uh, some people have done that. Um, there's a, there's a, a plethora of, of different types of little grow chambers you can purchase. Um, right. My favorite is to buy a cake, eat the cake, and then cut holes in the bottom of the pan and put the plastic um, homemade growth chamber over that came with the cake on the top. Looks pretty strange because not all of them are the same size, but I'm um, pretty frugal. Just ask my wife, who says I'm pretty cheap. Um, but that's what I, you know, um, that that does help. Yeah, you know, it keeps the moisture in there. It keeps, um, for example, if you didn't have a warming pad, that'd be very nice to keep the heat in there a little bit and help germinate. Um, so yeah, that that's a nice way of doing it. Since you're a frugal gardener, would you uh, recycle styrofoam cups for starting plants and then insert them into the garden? No, I wouldn't. Um, you know, styrofoam takes a long time to break down, and um, I basically wouldn't do that. I would use more of like a maybe a peat moss or a coconut core or something that will actually break down 
Um, otherwise, you go out to your garden and you've got you don't what happened out here. Someone just buried their garbage in your garden type of a look, and you might not want that if you want people to visit you ever. Maybe I should do that. I, it might be a good idea for me. But, um, no, I, I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't do that at all. Uh, just a couple more questions here. One is has to again do it the height of the lights over the plants. Um, do you have a recommended height? Can we assume that as the plants get taller, that you should raise the distance uh, between the plants and the lights? Lights. Um, start again. Oh, I, I would leave the lights maybe two or three inches above the plants, and as the plants grew, I would just keep it right at that height. Um, I have forgotten about them, and then you get like a, some type of a vining plant work its way into your light system. What a mess! So don't forget. But um, I would um, I would keep it two or three inches above, and then they start going up to it, and start touching, and I'd raise it again, two or three inches. You know, I put my hand on top of the plants, and then I drop the lights as far down as possible. And when my hand gets uncomfortably warm, then the plants get uncomfortably warm. I use that as a guide. Put my hand over the plants and, and feel for the you plants. You can do that. You can do that <laughs> okay. if you wanted to use your, yourself as a, a plant shield. To, <laughs> sure. I guess I'd rather burn a plant or wreck a plant than hurt myself, but um, everybody's got their own thing. So, yeah. You got it. Okay, one last thing here, Todd. How about, uh, you know, the front? The frost date's an important consideration for when to start your transplants. Do you know, how can I find out when's the last frost date for my county? You know, um, and on, um, quite excellent. Um, yeah, and, and, you, and, and you have to remember, too, it's not exact. So if it says, for example, um, looks like the last frost date is, you know, in the fall, September 28th. Well, maybe it'll be September 15th. Maybe it'll be in October. You, you really don't know. Um, so you have to give it some leeway when you um, when you read these things. It's not okay. Tomorrow's the twenty eighth. It's going to freeze. Not necessarily. So you have to have um, a little forgiveness when it when it's on there. It's um it's an average of when things have been that way. So I, I would go to Endon. If you have never been on the Endon site, it's quite remarkable. Um, there's a there's a ton of information on all over the state and. Um, well worth your time. I, w I would check that out. And if it isn't, um, let me know and I'll, and I'll apologize. Okay, Todd. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, Todd, for your presentation. It was great. We can't wait to start our seeds.